Good evening. My name is Betsy Steitz and I'm the president of the Woodbury Cottage Grove League of Women Voters. This evening, I am really excited to introduce you to Angie Hung, who is going to be updating us on everything you ever wanted to know about water. Um, before we do that, however, I always at the beginning of all our public events like to remind people of who we are and the importance of our nonpartisan um, policy. So our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. We envision a democracy where every person has the desire, the right, the knowledge and the confidence to participate. We value and empower and believe in women and men to create a more perfect democracy. The League of Women is a nonpartisan organization, neither supporting or opposing candidates or political parties at any level of government, but always working on vital issues of concern to members and the public. And that's why tonight, because it is a vital issue, we are going to be talking a lot about um, water uh, as it relates to us here in Washington County. So I'm going to turn it over to Lynn Marcus, who is a co-chair of an envi our environmental uh, team. And uh, Lynn, you can introduce Angie and away we go. We are delighted to have Angie Hong speak with us about the state of our lakes, rivers, streams, and groundwater in Southern Washington County. She will also share updates on local and state-led conservation projects. Angie is very knowledgeable about our local waters because she is the coordinator for Minnesota's East Metro Water Resource Education Program. This is a local partnership with 30 members in Washington, Ramsey, Chisago, and Asante counties. Angie has an MS in Natural Resources Science Management with an environmental education emphasis and a sustainable ag minor from the U of M Twin Cities and a BS in Zoology with a certificate in environmental studies from UW Madison. In her free time, which is hard to believe, she enjoys singing, competing in triathlons and exploring the prairies, woods and waterways of the St. Croix Valley. She lives in Stillwater with her husband, Gary, son, Charlie, dog, Molly, and cats, Teddy, Twilight, and Clover. Many of you have enjoyed Angie Hong's popular newspaper columns, social media, and interactive programs at community events and workshops. We are pleased to hear from her now. Take it away, Angie. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lynn, and thank you, Betsy. Um, thanks for inviting me today. And I was laughing because the dog Molly is lying here snoring loudly underneath, <laughs> underneath my feet as I present. So hopefully nobody hears snoring in the background while I am talking. Um, I just need the one second to share my screen so that everybody can see me. And there we go. Hopefully nothing. Lynn, would you give me a thumbs up that the gray bar is not blocking stuff at the top? Looks good. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I am going to be talking, giving a general overview of water resources in Washington County, but really emphasizing Southern Washington County, knowing that the members in this group are mostly in Woodbury Cottage Grove, St. Paul Park, Newport, Great Cloud in that area. Um, and if you want to play along, can people type in the chat or only the panelists? Do you know the answer to that? Hmm. I'm not actually so that they can type in the chat. Yeah, well, I just thought it would be fun to play along when I'm sharing photos and people can try to guess where in Washington County these photos were taken. Okay, I've turned that on. All right. Yeah, it just occurred to me like, hey, that would be kind of kind of fun. So this this will be your first test to see if you can guess where this photo was taken. Mm. It's not it's not Carver Lake, but that would be a good guess, but it's not. <laughs> All right. Um 
So this photo was actually taken along the gray cloud channel of the Mississippi River down by the uh, kind of the land bridge between Cottage Grove and Gray Cloud Township. Um, so Karen on here, I will start by telling you a little bit about myself and the program that I work with. Um, so as Lynn said, the East Metro Water Resource Education Program, I usually refer to it as MREP for short, um, but it has 30 local government partners. Um, I've got my contact information here. If you are wanting to get a hold of me anytime in the future, I'm always happy to take phone calls, emails. Um, you can tweet me, you can send me an Instagram message, however you want to get a hold of me. Happy to talk with you. Um, but the MRAP program has actually been going since 2006. And for a long time, it was kind of a one woman show. And then there was two. Uh, Barbara Heitkamp, whose photo is on the right-hand side of the slide, she started at the program in 2021. And so we now have two full-time educators, which is very exciting. Um, and have been able to just kind of continue and carry on the education. All right, just check in the chat to see what that question was. Um, so one of the things that happened in conjunction with, um, with Barbara getting hired is that we have been working as part of a Lower St. Croix Watershed Partnership. And um, I'm going to explain a little bit later about what that is, but basically we expanded our education program. So we used to only serve Washington County, and now we're serving portions of these northern counties as well, and helping to support locally led conservation work. So um, in Washington County in particular, there are free site visits for landowners, there are cost share grants to help offset the cost of conservation projects. There's a whole array of different workshops, volunteer events, project tours, community programs that are always happening. And we have 15 staff at the Washington Conservation District that have a range of expertise on lake stream, river wetland health, habitat restoration, things like that. Um, so the members in the MREP program, it is a mix of watershed management organizations, that's the ones on the left, um, cities and townships, counties, and then soil and water conservation districts. So those are the types of local government agencies that I'm working with on a regular basis. Um, and just the last thing in terms of orienting you to who I am and who I'm working with is to share this map of the watershed management organizations in Washington County. Um, this is something that's kind of unique in our area compared to other parts of the state. Um, to begin with, watershed districts and watershed management organizations are a special unit of government that mostly only exists in the metro area. Um, they are every part of the seven county metro area, and then they're in scattered locations across other parts of the state. Um, but in a lot of parts of the state, you're only going to have a county or a soil and water conservation district to work with on these kinds of things. Um, and in Washington County, we are, we like to say we're splitters instead of lumpers. So we actually have eight different watershed management entities. And if you are in this area, um, let me just close this real quick. If you're in this area, you're gonna be either in the South Washington, the Ramsey Washington, or the Valley Branch Watershed District if you're down in the South end of the county. All right, so. What I plan to talk about, a little bit about water quality trends with lakes and streams, wanted to give some updates about the Mississippi and the St. Croix River, uh, a little bit about some of the up and coming recent local and state conservation initiatives, and then what you can do. Um, so, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions, or if you've got questions as we're going that you want to type in the chat, that works for me also, that I can kind of pause and answer them as we're going along here. All right, this is your next opportunity to guess where this photo was taken. This is your next opportunity. Is, um, <laughs> I know where that is. That's, I know. Um, oh. Oh. Lynn O'Brien is a good guess. You're, you're geographically close to where it is. Oh. But it's not William O'Brien. 
This one is known as one of the best lakes in the county for swimming. Maybe I'll give it away by saying that. One of the best lakes in the county for swimming. Square Lake. Yep, it was Square Lake. All right, um, so water quality trends. I'm gonna start by talking about um, the bad stuff, but it's kind of, it, it, it's interesting because some things are getting better, some things are getting worse. Um, so if you are interested in knowing how any water body in Minnesota is doing, you can go to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, look up their impaired waters viewer, and there is an interactive map of the entire state of Minnesota. Now, when you open it up, I just have to warn you, it's kind of woo, scary, a little overwhelming because you open it up and you're instantly hit with a wave of red. Um, 2,904 impaired waters in Minnesota. So these are all lakes and streams that are not meeting water quality standards um, for a variety of reasons. The most common water quality impairments are mercury contamination, uh, sedimentation or excess nutrients. Those are kind of the, the three big things that we have um, the biggest problems with. So you can play around with this. Um, if you don't wanna have to look at the red and you just wanna look on the sunny side of life, which I often do, you can also turn off the red and this would light up in purple now. All of these are lakes and streams which have been delisted meaning these are ones that used to be impaired and because of community and government led efforts, we have been able to delist these water bodies and they're now meeting water quality standards. Uh, so I think that's pretty exciting. And, and in fact, when we look down at the local level in Washington County, just shy of 50% of the lakes actually have improving water quality. So they are getting better, not worse. And in cases where they are not getting better, oftentimes that's just because they're holding steady. Um, you know, they're, they're already a good lake and we're just holding it steady, trying to keep it from getting worse. Maybe it's a mediocre lake, but we don't have the funds to dedicate towards that particular lake right now because we're working on other lakes. Um, but in general, trends are getting better. And in fact, in 2022, which was just last year, there was 53 water bodies in Minnesota that got taken off of the impaired waters list and seven of those were in Washington County. So I think that's pretty awesome. We, I think we got a pretty big proportion considering that we're only one county um, and we took seven of those 53 off the impaired waters list. Uh, so you can see some of these lakes, um, East Boot Lake, this one is up in May Township, Echo Lake, this is in Matamidi. Um, Lake Plasted, this is like Hugo, May Township kind of area. Um, South Twin Lake, this is on the north end of Stillwater. Hay Lake, this is in Scandia. Those are some swans swimming there on Hay Lake. Um, and then the one that I personally felt the most excited about was Lily Lake in Stillwater. Um, this was so exciting to me because this has been such an enormous community effort for more than 20 years. Um, the lake was officially listed as being impaired for too much phosphorus in 2002. So 20 years it took to be able to get it off of the impaired waters list. Um, but it was even back in the 90s that the Lily Lake Lake Association was already beginning to mobilize, bring people together, talk to the city, say, hey, we think that um, trends are going bad with our lake. We're, you know, we don't see the clear water we used to. We're seeing more and more algae. And so they kind of mobilized to get the city and the watershed district to conduct a study in the first place to be able to figure out that the lake was impaired. And then that triggered, you know, just kind of like a whole, a whole series of activities. Um, yes, so what kinds of things did they do? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so the very first step was that they conducted a study just to kind of quantify what the scale of the problem was. And that was completed back in 2006. Um, they began chipping away. They, they knew that it was phosphorus, but they kind of had to have a numerical goal for how much phosphorus they needed to reduce. And the numerical goal was 140 pounds per year that were flowing into the lake from the surrounding watershed. 
Um, it's really challenging with Lily compared to maybe some of the lakes further north in the county because it's pretty much a fully developed watershed. And it's really expensive and really hard when you're having to retrofit already developed landscapes. Um, then there was a whole series of studies that happened around 2010 to 2012. Our office, Washington Conservation District, actually did these what are called sub-watershed analyses. Um, so they broke the whole surrounding watershed up into little pieces. And then they figured out how much phosphorus was coming out of each of these pieces. And then they picked places where they figured most of the, you know, it was kind of a GIS exercise. And then they would also, you know, ground truth it. Um, but they figured out, well, you know, here we've got an eroding ravine. Here we've got a neighborhood with a high degree of roads and impervious surface. Here we've got a stormwater pond, which could be fixed. Um, and then they've just been chipping away at it basically for the past 10 years. It's been a number of state grants through the Minnesota Clean Water Land and Legacy Act. Um, and so these state grants, you know, they usually come in three year chunks. And every three years, the um, Middle State Cray WMO would be able to do just a little bit more, um, you know, or sometimes the city's the one who's been able to get the grants. Uh, we put in a ton of neighborhood rain gardens around the lake. Um, they just put in one giant, giant rain garden. That's the one that these two ladies over here are planting last summer. Um, there have been super active volunteer mobilization to adopt storm drains in the surrounding neighborhoods and to um, take care of the new rain gardens. So all these people down here wearing the safety vests, they uh, were volunteers who were are out cleaning up and weeding the rain gardens. Um, and then this picture up here where there's the bonfire and the kids, we were ceremoniously burning the impairment to celebrate the delisting. This was our delisting party we had last fall. Um, and Mike and his wife, Barb, are two of the super active Minnesota water steward volunteers in that community who've been you know, helping to lead a lot of stuff. And you just get one snippet of music playing because I just thought this was so cute. The people in the neighborhood just like brought their music and started jamming in front of the lake to celebrate um, when we were having our delisting party. So there you go. You can kind of groove. <laughs> all right. So um, could you all hear the music? I don't remember if I if I no. remember this year. You couldn't? No. Oh. I know. Okay, here, here's what I'm going to do, because I didn't do the share sound or optimize for video clip. I'm resharing. Now I'm going to do it one more time. Now? Yes. That would just be so sad for me to tell you music was playing and you didn't get to hear it. I realized that right when it was playing that I probably hadn't shared my sound. Um, okay, so I told you the good things, the things that, that give me energy, give me inspiration, make me feel really good about the work that I do. And also, I unfortunately know that the work continues on. Um, one of the things that we are seeing is a big challenge for one, our northern lakes in particular, well, the ones that we consider our cleanest, the most pristine in the county, is a loss of biodiversity due to shoreline alterations. Um, so we're seeing this as a coming impact. Jane Lake, which is in Lake Elmo, and Bone Lake up in Scandia, these are two that just got listed in the latest round. They're meeting water quality standards, but then they don't have the assemblage of fish and wildlife that they should. And um, the PCA just kind of gave the Carnelian Marine St. Croix Watershed notice that big Carnelian and big marine are in danger at high risk. So we're launching a pretty intensive outreach effort to the people who live on these lakes to talk about um, not having, and I you know, don't want to pick out of this particular landowner, but not having a landscape that looks like this when you live on a lake, having um, the turf that goes all the way down to the shoreline because it doesn't promote biodiversity and doesn't create habitat for fish and wildlife, insects, birds, things like that. 
Um, the other big concern that we're seeing growing is chloride levels. And this is a concern for lakes and streams and also even actually for our groundwater reservoirs in the metro area in particular. Um, so statewide, there are 54 lakes and streams impaired for having too much chloride. In the Washington County area, um, Long Lake and Stillwater just got added last year. So that's the first new addition we've had. Uh, Tanner's Lake in Oakdale, Battle Creek and Carver Lakes in Woodbury, Coleman Lake in Maplewood, um, Battle Creek, and then Judicial Ditch number two up in Forest Lake, which kind of runs into the Sunrise River. So um, these 10, the ones that are impaired tend to be in places where, we're, you know, there's freeways, there's a lot of roads, and so we know it's coming from road salt, but they've also been doing some pretty intensive analyses of what all the sources are of chloride. And um, water softening salt is a pretty big source as well. Um, it's not necessarily the reason that these currently impaired ones are. Those are probably most in, impacted by the impervious surface and having the, you know, the road salt on the parking lots and the roads. Um, but in places where it's actually, you know, fairly rural, you wouldn't expect to be seeing chloride levels going up. They still are because of the um, water softening salt and then even dust suppressant used for gravel roads is a, another surprising reason that people might not know that contributes chloride. Um, and then at the same time, we're seeing mercury levels start to fall, which is pretty amazing. Um, and this is really due to statewide and regional policies, which are moving us away from having coal burning power towards having more renewable energy sources. Um, they did not expect um, when the when the PCA was putting together kind of like this statewide mercury reduction strategy, they didn't expect the statewide reductions to have an impact necessarily on the lakes, um, because we know that there's mercury coming from outside our state and coming from other countries even, you know, comes all the way around the world from China. Um, but surprisingly, in 2020, 12 lakes statewide were delisted. This was the first time in the history of Minnesota that they've ever delisted states um, and or delisted lakes for mercury. So Forest Lake, Tanner's Lake, Owasso, and Joanna were ones in our area that got delisted. Um, the bad part is that we do still have 1,600 lakes statewide where they have fish consumption advisories due to having too much mercury in the fish tissue. So these might be super pristine lakes. It includes a lot of what we would consider some of the cleanest lakes in the state up in, you know, even in the boundary waters. Um, but because the mercury is mostly coming from atmospheric deposition, it can end up in super clear, clean lakes. So that just kind of speaks to the importance of, you know, thinking um, what, what is best allowing dust from dirt roads to waft into water bodies or applying the dust suppressant. That's a tough question. Um, I would probably lead more towards putting down the dust suppressant because we actually see a pretty big um, impact from just erosion on gravel roads. Oddly enough, you know, people tend to assume that dirt roads or gravel roads are less impactful than paved ones. And if paved ones are designed correctly, a lot of times that's not actually the case. Um, you know, if you think of the fact that they have to put new gravel down every year on most gravel roads, it's because it's going somewhere. So they can, you know, actually be fairly problematic. Okay, so Mississippi River, the river in your backyard. Um, do you remember the very first photo with the paddleboard? This is like if we just turned around and we were facing the opposite direction, what you would see on the see, see behind us in that view. So there's this little skinny, um, little skinny bridge that you can drive across. You have to get down to, you know, the very southern part of Cottage Grove and you could go across that little skinny bridge to get down into the Gray Cloud Island. Um, there's a tiny little park called Moore's Park. And there's, I think, two or three parking spots there. Um, they also have a kayak rental that is in like a locker that you can pick up kayaks, um, but you can get onto the backwater channels there. So that's kind of a, a fun secret place if you didn't know that that existed. Uh, so the Mississippi River, the Friends of the Mississippi River 
has the state of the river report, which they put together in 2012. And in 2016, and we're now entering 2023 and they're kind of overdue for another state of the river report. Um, so I am eager to know if they are going to do that. Um, but what we have is information from the last one that they did, which is a little over five years ago now. And in the state of the river report, they were looking specifically at the Metro Mississippi River, what's going good and what is not going well. So the things that are going good are basically all related to wildlife. Uh, we have more bald eagles than we used to have. The native freshwater mussel populations are coming back. The fish populations are increasing. I think it was 1920 that they only found like two living fish in the entire Metro Mississippi River. Not like two species, but like two fish total. Um, and now there's an award-winning bass fishery. There's all sorts of fish that are in the river. Now on the bad side, um, there are dramatically increased flow rates because of the way drainage happens statewide. So in both metro areas and in farming regions where they're putting in drain tile, they're putting in ditches and taking the water off the land in the spring when all the snow is melting, um, in the early summer when it's raining a lot, this ramps up the amount of water that's going into the river. It causes a lot of stream bank erosion, river bank erosion. Um, but then the other thing is that it carries a lot more sediment, phosphorus, and nitrate down the river. And that pretty much is all just heading down. It's going through all the, you know, all the next 13 states that the river passes through and down to the Gulf of Mexico, contributing to that really big um, dead zone that we have down there. Then there's a couple of kind of emerging concerns. And it's PFAS, mercury, microplastics, pharmaceuticals, things like that, that uh, we weren't necessarily thinking about 10 years ago, but are realizing is a problem now. Uh, so one of the things that is kind of exciting and interesting to think about, the US Army Corps of Engineers is actually studying um, whether or not it would make sense to remove the Lower St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam and Lock and Dam Number Two, which is known as the Horde Dam. Um, Friends of the Mississippi River has been doing a lot of community engagement work around this issue, having a lot of meetings. They have great information on their website. Um, but one of the things I thought was coolest to look at um, was these photo illustrations that kind of envision what would this change look like. So first you can see, here's a photo of the Lower St. Anthony Falls. And here's an illustration of what it would look like if that disappeared. Um, they're not considering taking away the Upper St. Anthony Falls uh, Dam because that is important for maintaining water supply for the public drinking water in Minneapolis and St. Paul. It also helps to block Asian carp or anything else from swimming upstream. Um, but it would pretty dramatically change the river to, to take out the lower dam. Um, this is a very similar illustration. This shows what it would look like if the Ford Dam were taken away and if the associated buildings kind of disappeared at the same time that the, uh, that the dam went away. Okay, so this brings us all to a brand new bridge that was built in 2017 now, or is it 2019? Ooh, 2019, I think, um, to help get the water flowing again in the Gray Cloud Channel. And I've got a nice little video about this, and it's perfect timing because my dog is scratching to go outside, so I'm just going to play the video while I go litter outside real quick. There is an entire backwater channel of the Mississippi River south of St. Paul, Minnesota that was plugged up and stopped flowing for 50 years due to a clogged culvert. When the Mississippi River flows through Minnesota, it takes this really wiggly route as it goes through Minneapolis and St. Paul, and then it takes a very sharp turn at the bottom of Washington County right by Gray Cloud Island. In the same place, there's a long skinny channel that separates Gray Cloud Island from the rest of the county. In 1923, the county built a road across the channel so that people could get to the island, and there was a culvert 
underneath the road so that the water could continue flowing through. But there was a couple of big floods in the 1960s and the culvert got plugged. So the water couldn't flow through and for 50 years it just sat there stagnating, filling up with sediment and muck and all sorts of algae. Finally, five years ago in 2017, the South Washington Watershed District and Washington County worked together to build a bridge and the water is flowing free again. If you head there during the summertime, you can actually float a canoe or a kayak down the stretch and it's this really great kind of secret stretch of river that almost nobody explored. And that's a beautiful area down there. It is, it is. I always feel like it's such a secret destination that it took me so long to even figure out how to get there, honestly. So it's so hidden and out of the way. Um, okay, so I'm gonna switch rivers. I'm gonna flip flop from the Mississippi to the St. Croix River. And uh, this is a sandbar somewhere south of Marine and north of Stillwater. It's just out there somewhere in the river. Um, it's amazing how you can get onto the St. Croix and be so close to the cities and feel like you're just in the middle of absolute nowhere. Um, you know, not even getting cell reception, not seeing people. It's, you know, it's really a treasure to have a wild and scenic river so close to us. Um, so there is a new partnership, which I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, the Lower St. Croix Watershed Partnership. This is part of a statewide initiative, which is the One Watershed, One Plan process. And the idea is to have local government and state government all kind of work together to create these regional watershed management plans. So instead of, you know, we do a really good job of collaborating within Washington County, but instead of just thinking Washington County, we're actually um, working with 15 local government partners that are in, you know, Chisago, Pine, Isani, Anoka counties. And um, as part of this partnership, so the, these entities all started working together, spent about three years creating a 10-year watershed management plan, and then now receive $1.2 million every two years from the state in order to implement the plan. Um, so this is entirely focused on just the portion of Washington County that goes to Little Lower St. Croix, um, the portion of all of those counties that goes to Lower St. Croix, but um, you know, if you're kind of most interested in what's happening in your own backyard, I thought I'd highlight some of those projects. Um, so what have we been able to do? We had um, the first two-year installation started in 2021. So we're just wrapping up that first two years of funding, the first $1.2 million. Um, we were able to hire two new staff people. So I mentioned Barbara. Um, she helped us to be able to expand our education program. And then Jennifer Hahn is specifically focusing on agronomy outreach, working with farmers in the region. And she's awesome. She founded uh, the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition. She grew up on a farm in Chisago County. She knows her stuff, um, has been really great. The farmers love working with her. Um, in the first two years, she developed this new non-structural ag program, which gives incentive payments to farmers to use cover crops and we were able to get 335 acres of cover crops with six large landowners. And that translates into a 682 pound per year phosphorus reduction. Um, that might, like those numbers might sound like gobbledygook, um, but basically one pound of phosphorus translates into 500 pounds of algae. So 682 pounds of phosphorus is like a lot. It, it's a really big um, water quality improvement. Um, there have also been nine large scale ag, urban and wetland restoration projects completed in the first two years of the program. That was another 554 pounds per year phosphorus reduction. And then another thing that the plan has been focused on in the early years spe specifically has been doing some studies to really identify where work is needed, especially in the northern part of the watershed. Um, they don't have nearly as much funding available in Pine County, Isani County, Northern Chisago County as we do down here. So one of the beauties of having this kind of like urban suburban collaboration is, or urban rural collaboration is that we're able to take our, you know, the, the funding and kind of share it throughout the whole watershed. Um, so they were able to do some studies on Forest Lake looking at um, internal phosphorus loading, 
and look at runoff going to the Sunrise River, Rock Lake, and a bunch of the little streams up in northeastern Washington County. Um, so just to highlight a couple that are in our area in particular, because you know some of them have been in other counties, but there was a really large project completed in Denmark Township along the St. Croix River. This was a huge eroding ravine that was stabilized in the first year of the project. And then another thing that the South Washington Watershed District has been working on is restoring Trout Brook. That's the one that flows through Afton Alps and Afton State Park. Um, so that has been a hugely exciting project. They're taking what used to be a ditched straight stream and they're re-meandering it and making it back into a living stream again. So I was just talking with uh, Mark Nessa from the Minnesota DNR last week, and he was telling me when they first started surveying trout brook in the 90s, they only found a handful of trout, and that was it. Um, but now they are finding hundreds of trout swimming in the stream because of these um, improvement projects. So that's been really great. Up in Forest Lake, this photo that you're looking at right here, um, Forest Lake has been, the Comfort Lake Forest Lake Watershed District has been focusing a lot on wetland restoration. So they're taking a lot of places where there was wetlands that were ditched and they are reconnecting those to become natural wetlands again. So it's not only a phosphorus reduction, but it's also creating um, flood resiliency. So now there's some place for the water to go. It's not just going down the ditch to the lake. Um, so since this trout brick one is pretty cool and I've got a little video about this one and you know, my dog, she just must predict it because now she's scratching at the door to get back in again. So I'm going to let, <laughs> I'm going to let John Loomis and I tell you about the trout brick project in Afton. If you walk a little ways off the beaten track at Afton State Park, you will run into trout brook, which flows out of the Afton Alps ski area and goes through the park down to the St. Croix River. Historically, the stream was ditched when it went through this property. Just this past fall, South Washington Watershed District worked with Afton Alps and was able to re-meander the stream. And this will create new habitat for trout and other native fish, as well as the insects that they like to eat. We're standing here with John Loomis from the South Washington Watershed District. And John, can you tell me when and how this project got started? So this project actually predates South Washington's jurisdiction over the area. Um, restoring trout brook habitat to support fish uh, in some form was actually a goal of the former Lower St. Croix Watershed Management Organization. Uh, when South Washington absorbed this area, we, we adopted their plan as one of our guidance documents. So far at Afton Alps, we have re-meandered the part of the stream that goes through the Afton Alps parking lot. Uh, so previously, uh, before our project, the, the stream just went straight through their parking lot in a ditch. Uh, the floodplain was not connected at all to the channel, so water just tore through and was constantly eroding. There was no habitat that stream and put it in a new channel that goes around the Afton Alps parking lot and kind of meanders around within the floodplain like you would expect a small stream to do. There's woody debris all through the corridor kind of meant to anchor different parts of the stream in place so that while the stream can move around a little bit it won't move a lot and start encroaching on the ski hill of the parking lot. Right, so that is Trout Brook. And they are continuing the work on Trout Brook this coming spring. So if you are out at Afton State Park, you will notice construction um, pretty much as soon as the ski season's over, starting sometime in April. They're gonna be working on, so they already like re-wiggled the part that goes through Afton Alps, and now they're working on the part that's just immediately downstream of Afton Alps as it enters Afton State Park. Um, what you'll see for the coming year is you'll see like the straight stream that the water will still be going through and then the wiggly part right next door to it. And then once the vegetation gets established in the wiggly part, then they'll kind of turn off the straight part <laughs> and redirect the water so it starts going through the wiggly part. Um, so it, it will be kind of interesting to you know see that in action. 
but what about the zebra mussels? Yeah, um, I don't know that they are up into Trout Brook, um, but that's a really great question for me to ask for me to ask the DNR folks or John about that if if they are migrating up into the stream itself or if they're purely in the river. Um, if you could hold. I'm so sorry about that. And suddenly, my <laughs> dog just chowing away. She had found um, a bag of snacks in my son's backpack and was eagerly ripping them all open. Um, yeah, I know that there are, the, the zebra mussels are in the St. Croix River. And so what I'm not sure is if they have a way to migrate up into a smaller stream like Trout Brook or not. So that's, that's actually an interesting question for me to ask them about. Um, one other thing that the Lower St. Croix funding has been going towards, this is a new thing which um, we're going to be doing across the whole lower watershed is developing these targeted enhanced street sweeping programs. Um, so you can see the list of the cities in Washington County where they're happening, South Washington, Ramsey, Washington, watershed districts also funded a similar plan to happen in the city of Woodbury, which is starting this year. Um, and then there's a plan in Forest Lake, which started in 2019. Um, and this might seem like, well, what's, what's the big deal about street sweeping? This has actually been found to be one of the most cost-effective, impactful ways to get sediment and phosphorus off of the streets and keep it from going into our waterways. So we're working kind of across the whole metro area to try to get cities developing and implementing these targeted enhanced street sweeping plans. And they are in development literally as, as I type and will start happening pretty much this fall. Okay, so um, we used to have a really great bi-state collaboration with partners in Wisconsin and I don't want to say that there is a lack of enthusiasm in Wisconsin, but there are much fewer people who are working on the river, on that side of the river than there used to be. Um, so that is something which is a little discouraging. Um, we used to have a St. Croix Basin team that met on a regular basis and it had people from the Minnesota DNR and the Wisconsin DNR the local governments on both sides of the river, a St. Croix Watershed Research Station, all these people would get together on a regular basis. Um, and a lot of the people in Wisconsin have, unfortunately, you know, they've left their positions, the positions didn't get refilled. Um, so we have a lot going on in the Minnesota side and just not nearly as much as happening on the Wisconsin side. However, we do every summer do a St. Croix River workshop on the water, which is something I enjoy. It's actually, I think, the favorite event I do every year. And basically, we invite local elected officials like city council people, county commissioners, um, planning commission members from all the cities along both sides of the river, and we get them all in a boat. And then we have a whole series of presentations and interactive activities to talk to them about land use and water quality and what kinds of decisions they can make as local leaders to help better protect the water. Um, so this is just a photo from last year's 2022 workshop on the water. Okay, so I just want to pivot a little bit then to talking about local and state-led conservation initiatives. Anybody know where this photo is? This one's getting really close to home for those of you in Woodbury. Recognize this one. one. Yep. Okay. So this is the, the brand new coming soon to a park near you, Glacial Valley Park. And this is right on the southern border of Woodbury and northern border of Cottage Grove. And um, what this is, is a large protected area, which was originally set aside for um, flood prevention which the Watershed District has now been working to restore to native prairie and oak savanna. There was a tiny little remnant prairie on it to begin with, but most of the area had been in farming and is now going back into prairie. And I do have a tiny little, oh, 
did I, maybe I have it further on. I have a tiny little video about it further on. Um, so I guess just kind of starting at the higher level, there was the Minnesota Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment passed back in 2008. And this created a pool of funds, which we have been tapping into heavily in our local area ever since then. Um, so in the water portion in particular, there was $1.2 billion in clean water funding for projects since 2010. Um, and we very, very heavily apply for and use these um, grant funds. This was an absolute game changer. When I first started in 2006, we were hardly able to do any projects. Because everything was contingent on having local funding. Um, so having the state funds and a regular, just consistent source, it's really been, really been impactful. Um, another thing that's been really impactful in Washington County in particular, um, the county passed something called a Land and Water Legacy Program that actually predated the state's one by one year. And this one was focused on preserving high quality habitat, so permanently protecting the land so it won't get developed or farmed. Over the past 15 years, the county has set aside 1,100 acres of high quality habitat. And this photo that you're looking at right here is two of my coworkers out touring, uh, one that just recently got set aside in May Township. Um, just a beautiful, beautiful woods up there. So 34 projects have been funded by this um, Washington County Land and Water Legacy Program, and it's enabled the county to add on to a lot of the regional parks, Big Marine, Lake Elmo, Pine Point, St. Croix Bluffs, the future Gray Cloud Island Regional Park. Um, and there's actually several other chunks of land if you um, are able to, let's see, I wonder if I'm, I'm not able to, I'm not able to copy and paste into the chat, but I'll copy and paste into the chat at the end of the presentation. If you go to this um, ArcGIS story map, it's kind of fun because you can just float around the county and see all the different places that have been protected. And there's a couple that are down in Woodbury as well that aren't on this list. Um, another cool program that I am absolutely in love with is the South Washington Campus Greening Program. And this photo is a bunch of kids getting ready to plant trees on their school property at Middleton Elementary. This was about five years ago, I think that this project started. Um, but what the Watershed District is doing is they're working with the school district to include these campus retrofits as part of their regular CIP schedule. So every time the school district would be doing just like a normal parking lot upgrade or adding on to a school, instead of doing the stormwater pond, which would meet the stormwater rules requirement, they're actually taking a really holistic look at the school campuses and taking non-active use turf out of commission, turning it into native landscaping. Um, and then the Watershed District has also started a partnership with Carpenter Nature Center. So then the Nature Center staff comes out and they do a whole series of five programs with the students that's all about, you know, watersheds, how does a watershed work, what are native plants, what makes them special. Um, we're moving the programming to be sixth grade this coming year because it used to be like a fourth and fifth grade program and there's so many elementary schools it was hard, um, you know, they could only ever do a couple schools per year. But moving it to the sixth grade level, there's only four middle schools in the South Washington School District. And so this way they should be able to hit every sixth grader in all four of those middle schools every year. Um, so, you know, we're pretty excited about that, that pretty much every kid in the district will get to have this like series of programming at least once in their school career. Um, okay, here's what, here we go. Here's where you get to see the video about the Glacial Valley Park on the border of Woodbury and Cottage Grove. Um, we are in the midst right now, the South Washington Watershed District is in the midst of designing interpretive signs, and they will be actually starting to build the trails this coming spring. So once again, as soon as the snow melts, you should expect to see people out there starting to build trails. Um, but they are eventually also going to have an interpretive center that will be on site where there will be, you know, a little auditorium, like an outdoor amphitheater, not, a, not an indoor auditorium, but outdoor amphitheater with seating and ability to have all sorts of education programming happening. So here's just a short video so you get to see the prairie plants. 
everything else around here is going to become houses but this chunk of land where I am standing will not and I'm about to tell you why this is the future Glacial Valley Park on the border of Woodbury and Cottage Grove in Minnesota. The development is booming around here, but this 250 acres is permanently protected and being restored to Oak, Savannah, and Prairie as part of a regional flood prevention project. Nobody gets excited about this except for me. Looks like coyote scat. Hello, is anyone home? This part right here doesn't look like much right now. This will completely fill up with water like a lake after a 100 year storm of it. So this is part of a massive connected corridor that runs from here. It goes down through Cottage Grove, through the Cottage Grove Ravine Regional Park, across 3M property, and eventually to the Mississippi River. All right, so that is happening in your backyard. Um, here is another thing that is happening in your backyard. There is a brand new park being created in Woodbury that is just uh, east of Powers Lake Hassenbank Stormwater Park. Um, one of the cool things about this is that they are restoring habitat and they are using goats, which is always cool. Um, another cool thing about this is that they actually just did a call for artists and will be having artists commissioning some installations. We're not sure yet what they'll look like because, um, you know, that, that's to come from whatever the, the artists envision, but um, there'll be some cool signs or installations happening. But I know that Lynn said that she had been recruiting volunteers already for this May 16th planting event. Um, we are looking for 30 to 40 volunteers, so quite a lot of volunteers, to help with native seeding at this park on May 16th. It's a Tuesday from 4 till 6 p.m., and I'll give you a taste of the goats. You don't have to watch the whole video, but you do want to see the goats, right? Yes. <laughs> so the South Washington Watershed District, we're a local unit of government, and our primary mission is to protect the waters of the state, protect waters locally. So we work with the city of Woodbury, helping them with some terrestrial habitat projects as we really kind of see the connection between terrestrial habitat and aquatic habitat being a really strong connection. So at Hassan Bank Woods, we're looking at a multi-faceted effort to provide habitat improvement, as well as clean the waters coming through Fish Lake, Powers Lake, and then the terrestrial areas between. And so in Hassan Bank Woods, we're trying to essentially restore these woods. In this particular case, we did a forestry mowing in March. And if you look around the forest floor, you can see just sort of shattered remnants of these very large buckthorn, but also non-native honeysuckles, as well as the garlic mustard that often comes in right after we do a buckthorn removal. In this case, we were looking to get them during that spring flush. So buckthorn is a species that really takes advantage of the light levels when there's not a lot of canopy cover. So before the canopy trees leaf out, buckthorn leaves out really early, puts a lot of energy into growth in that early period. And then in the fall, it does the same thing where it outlasts the, after the trees have all dropped their leaves, buckthorn will remain green, continue to photosynthesize and continue to grow, putting its energy back into the ground. So we'll bring in goats both in spring and in fall to hit those two periods. I think we have about 60 out here right now. One of the things we're trying to do in the restoration field is come up with ways to do this kind of restoration work, particularly trying to control invasive species and move away from just going towards using chemicals right away. And one of the things that the goats do is they really weaken these species that we're targeting. And that significantly reduces the amount of herbicides that we're gonna end up using to the end after that two and a half, three year period. And so that's one of the great advantages of using goats. One of the things we're really after here is trying to move towards a more resilient landscape, something that the city of Woodbury can manage into the future after we've really knocked that back. And that's why it takes us multiple years before we get to the point where we feel comfortable with stepping back and having a less aggressive sort of management strategy. And the goats are just a part of that. <laughs> All those goats make me so happy. I just love seeing them. Um, so, we would love volunteers and I'm hoping that you might be one of them for the March, March, or I'm sorry, not March. Oh, can you imagine if we were seating on March 16th <laughs> with three feet of snow on the ground? May 16th, hopefully we won't have three feet by then. 
maybe we'll down, be down to three inches. I don't know. Um, and just one more kind of in your backyard project to mention uh, new stormwater treatment at Carver Lake Park. And this is in the Alder Watershed District in Woodbury, the Ramsey Washington Metro Watershed District. Um, so if you go to Carver Lake Park, you'll notice new rain gardens, new, you know, vegetated swales, all sorts of stuff in the parking lot, which is pretty cool. Okay, so I'm going to wrap things up with some of the what can you do. Um, this is Cole Williams, who was a Minnesota water steward. She joined the South Washington Watershed District Board, and then she just moved away off to Florida, which I'm very sad about. Um, but she uh, took a photo at Wag Dog Park in Cottage Grove, where last year with a little grant fund that she was able to get, um, she did a whole bunch of buckthorn removal there with other volunteers. So one of the things that you can do is you can support the existing awesome programs which are working. So the Washington County Land and Water Legacy Program is actually going to be going up to vote for reauthorization, I believe in 2024. And so this was like a vote that happened in 2006 that initially authorized a set chunk of money to set aside the high quality habitat. Um, that money has run out. And so now they're going to be asking to reauthorize it and get another chunk of money to continue doing that work. Um, there are a number of citizen volunteer programs which are for more than just a one-time volunteer activity. Um, so AIS detectors, Minnesota water stewards, master gardeners, master nationalists. These are programs where you kind of get trained in a subject matter that you become an expert on, and then you act as a voice in your community. You help to interface between the local government and the people that you know, your friends and family. Um, this is Link Lavi. He lives on one of the tri lakes in Lake Elmo, and he's a certified AIS detector. So he's talking to people in the neighborhood all about the aquatic invasive species and what they can do to help prevent the spread. Um, another thing is that the watershed districts have citizen advisory committees and the cities have environmental, um, you know, every, every city calls it something a little bit different. Some of them might call it like an environmental commission. Um, some of them have the parks and trails planning commission. Some of them have both. Uh, Woodbury has an environmental stewardship community initiative, which they are really going to be focusing a lot on this year. And so they're going to be looking for community support for implementing all sorts of these kind of environmental stewardship, climate resiliency kind of uh, agenda items that they've thought of. The Adopt a Drain program. This is a pretty cool program that is more like hey, I don't have all year, I've just got 15 minutes, what can I do? And we're asking people to adopt the storm drain in front of their house and just agree to go out there and clean up the litter and clean up the leaves and the grass clippings in order to keep them from getting washed in the storm drains that go to lakes and rivers. But 19,315 drains adopted in Minnesota. I mean, I think it's pretty cool. That's a lot of, a lot of people going out and just doing these simple volunteer activities that end up adding up to a lot. 961 of those are adopted in Washington County. Um, and then the other thing I always like to remind people is that you, if you own a home or you own property or you have a cabin, you actually play a really critical role in helping to build, protect, rebuild the native habitat. 75% um, of the land in Minnesota is privately owned. So even just creating a pocket native garden on your property is really impactful for the pollinators, for the birds, for all these other wildlife species. And in case you think that, you know, well, what difference could I make on just one person? Uh, we have a map where we have been mapping all of the people that we have worked with in Washington County over the past 10 years or so, 5,325 projects. So every one of those little dots there is somebody who has done something. And see, look at that. We even, we even splattered and spread out into the other counties also. Um, they, <laughs> they just aren't, I'm sure that they're doing well as, as well as us, but um, just haven't been tracking them the way that we have. So, all right, we have come to the time where I can, Kind of do an active Q and A, 
And if you're wondering where this one is, I'll give you a hint. It's a prairie in Southern Washington County. And it's a scientific natural area. And it's not Gray Cloud Dunes. <laughs> it's got the word prairie in it. Oh. Yeah, here somebody has it. <laughs> this one is from Lost Valley Prairie Scientific Natural Area that's in Denmark Township. It's, I don't know how to describe where it is, kind of near Carpenter Nature Center, but not really. <laughs> Okay, lovely. Do we have any, any questions or additional conversation to be had? <laughs> While people are typing into the chat, would you like to say a little bit more about where people can find information about to, how to be involved in the Adopt-A-Storm Drain? Oh, Adopt-A-Storm Drain, yeah. So if you just go to here, I, I will. Oh, if I type, will it go to everybody or just hosts and panelists? Oh, hmm. Okay, if you go to adopt-a-drain.org, that will be where you can find a storm drain in your neighborhood and click to sign up and adopt it. Yeah, it looks like if I type in the chat, for some reason, only the other panelists can see it and not the participants. And it's true that people are naming these drains now? I know, they do. Yeah, you can name your drain. And some people just name it something boring like Angie's drain, but then no. Other people get really, really creative. So it's like Dwayne the Rock or, you know, just just all sorts of um, funny, funny things that they think of. <laughs> Yeah, it's not. Um, everyone is not an option. It's just hosts and panelists or um, the three panelists I can type to directly. But yeah, you know, this is a weird idiosyncrasy I discovered the other day when I was also presenting on a webinar platform that if you're a panelist, for some reason, you can only chat with other panelists and not the whole crowd, which seems weird to me. But anyway. And if you have no other questions, that's okay too. I'm cool with that. <laughs> You've covered a lot of material. I know, I know. Around the county, up north and down to the east. I know, I know. The south. Like I said, it was kind of overwhelming. I'm like, okay, this will be a good practice on, you know, what all is going on. It's a lot. <laughs> And then, and I didn't even talk really about groundwater at all. I was just like, ah, oh, I just, I can't even talk about that anymore. <laughs> well, that can be another program. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, I feel like that's kind of its, its own presentation in and of itself, all the stuff going on with the groundwater. Well, the good news is that we've got so much good news. Often in the, in the news, it tends to be bad news. And, and I think it's really wonderful you were able to give us some good information about how we've seen improvements and the role mm -hmm. of um, our local communities and all the different things that people are able to do to, to make a difference. So it, it, yeah. uh, it's pretty inspiring. Yeah, I, I really, you know, people sometimes underestimate how big of an impact we can have. And I agree with you totally. When you hear the news, it just seems like bad, 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 bad. And it's like, no, we, we really can. <laughs> when, we, when we try, we do, we, you know, we do well, we succeed. So um, it has been really nice to see more happening. Um, so yeah, so the question on, uh, let's see. We'll start with, so as a landowner, if I want to plant native, um, you would contact, uh, I think, the best first stop is the Washington Conservation District. So it wouldn't be me personally, it would be one of my coworkers. Uh, we offer free site visits for anybody in Washington County. So you go to mnwcd.org and there is a little button there to click to sign up for a free site visit. 
They won't do it right now. They'll do it once the snow is gone. Um, but they can tell you about any of the grants that are available in your area. So that is pretty slick and easy. And then if you get a grant, they can also help you with all the questions that you'll have, like, where do I buy the plants? And what should I design it? And, you know, what contractor can I hire? And all those kinds of things. Um, the question on how are we doing with the situation with too much mercury and not being able to eat the fish in our lakes? So that is, that one is kind of a tricky one because whereas a lot of these other examples I've shared, we can take local action and have a local impact. The mercury really needs to be like state, regional, national, worldwide change in order to reduce just the amount of mercury going into our atmosphere. So Minnesota has been good about putting together this statewide plan and really being able to reduce the amount of mercury emissions. Um, a lot of the other states in the US are doing the same thing. So like at a state level and national level, we're doing better worldwide. Things are not really doing better in the reduction of mercury emissions. Um, so that's something that we just kind of have to keep. <laughs> to keep hoping on. <laughs> um, and that's the same question with where can I get help on starting a rain garden? Um, signing up for a site visit with the conservation district is a really great first step um, because we've helped people to build all sorts of rain gardens. We do also at the website have like downloadable print materials on how to build a rain garden and um, I've given presentations in the past like that are just entirely on how to build a rain garden. So you can watch recorded presentations from our website also. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so the lawn service folks. Uh, so I have my, like, I kind of have like my list of audiences that are easier and harder to interact with and engage. And these are the, the they're up in my harder, my harder to engage. They've definitely been on my list <laughs> for years. Um, and we kind of go all around, you know, just thinking of different ways to try to better engage the lawn care companies. Um, you know, we've tried working directly with them. There is a certification program that the MPCA developed along with um, Fortin Consulting, which became part of Fulton Mink, but they have like a certification program that turf care companies can go through to learn how to do better um, they don't necessarily come swarming to those workshops. Then we started working with HOAs directly because we figured, well, they're hiring a lot of the turf companies. Um, we just literally last week applied for a grant. Um, just literally last week applied for a grant to do some continued work with HOAs in our area. So hopefully, um, hopefully we'll do that. But yeah, yeah, we know that. The one thing that is good is that in Minnesota, we have a phosphorus-free fertilizer law. So on residential lawns, they shouldn't, you know, it's against the law, they shouldn't be putting down phosphorus fertilizer. Um, so when we're looking at phosphorus, you know, it's not usually actually coming from like the residential fertilizer. It's maybe coming from the farms or just from uh, the natural phosphorus that's in leaves and grass clippings and sediment. Well, with that, we should probably yeah. let you go. You've given us a more than a full hour's worth. And uh, we really appreciate it a lot, Angie. Yeah. It's been a great evening. Well, thank you so much. And yeah, do let me know when you have the recording available because I'd love to be able to share it also. All righty. Okay. It's been great to have you, um, Angie. And um, it, it, I want to uh, say thank you to Lynn also because um, she's the reason that you're here because of the contact she has uh, and her enthusiasm about uh, the environment and water. So thank you, thank you to both of you. Um, just a couple of things that are coming up in April. Uh, we've got another busy uh, month. Uh, we've got our environmental um, group that meets on the third. We've got uh, voter outreach at Woodbury Expo uh, at the, uh, actually April 1st from 10 to four. And then uh, our Let's Talk series continues on the eighth. Um, local Observer Corps on the 10th. We've got a new member coffee on the 15th and conversation at the library. And then 
um, ending up on April 22nd at the Capitol with the Environmental Day. So it's a busy month uh, again, and we're um, really looking forward to a lot of people participating in all these things. So again, thank you, Angie. We really appreciate the time and um, all your expertise. It's wonderful. You all have a great rest of the evening. <laughs>